few prayer requests and then we're going to worship the Lord together. Um, Chris Pitt still needs our prayer. She's uh, been in and out of hospital. She's having a, a blood transfusion again this week. Continue to pray for Angela as she's going through her treatment for cancer. Obviously, Sarah's dad in hospital. Keep on praying for him, for Benita, for Matt Bradley. And uh, many of you will know John Price, uh, the founder of Pastor Junction 10, uh, is waiting in the QE for some brain surgery today, hopefully. So would you stand with me? Let's pray. Let's just commit these needs to the Lord. Then we can worship him together and uh, come around his word. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that we're able to come to a God that knows. And, and this morning, Lord, we pray for these needs that we've just mentioned. Lord, we pray that where we cannot go, that you will go into hospitals, into people's homes. That, Lord Jesus, into these situations that you'd pour out your spirit and healing would flow. And that, Father, these people that are poorly right now would be raised up, Lord. We, we're praying for miracles today, Lord. We pray for signs and wonders and miracles, Lord Jesus. So today, release your anointing and blessing in this house. In Jesus' name. Well, we're just still in prayer as we were here this morning, just praying. A guy just turned up out of the blue, said, could you pray for me? His name's Peter. I lost my next door neighbour. He committed suicide yesterday. We were able to pray with him, minister to him, give him a Bible. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Pete this morning. That, Father, Lord, you draw his heart. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're in the business of drawing men and women unto yourself. And so today, give us a great day as we're in the house of God together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning to everybody here. Good morning to everybody online. It's uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's just worship our King. Yeah. Our King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today. 
Sometimes we know something to be true in our mind and even so we believe it in our hearts but then the circumstances of our life seem to overshadow everything and I have a feeling this morning some of you have been singing those words and you, you, you say I know it's true but I really want it to be true so we're going to sing it once again unaccompanied and I want you to make this a faith declaration let's take these words as a battering ram to the spiritual realms let's tell the devil and all his hordes if our God's for us, then who can be against us? If God is with us, then we are going to win this battle. We're going to see this victory through. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we belong to him this morning. We're not just anybody. We're sons and daughters of the living God. So let's sing it, but let's sing it in, in faith. And if, if you can't even muster a little bit, just a tiny little bit of faith, muster it right now. If you've got circumstances in your life that you think, well, I just need a breakthrough, let's, let's just declare our God is healer. He's awesome in power, our God. Sing it again, Steve. Just the, just the voices. Can we just take the note? We'll sing it with the voices, please. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, Let's sing that again. And if my God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if my God is with us, then what can stand against? And if my God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if my God is with us, then what can stand against? Our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God.
Jesus, Jesus.
Having done all, stand. Amen. Take your seats. Uh, Friday, uh, Friday, Tuesday prayer meeting here at 7.30. Uh, if you can make it, there have been some incredible times of God's presence. So that's this week. Um, I wasn't here last week. As you know, I was uh, watching the Lord of the Rings in bed. Um, <laughs> but some, some family news, a couple of pieces of family news. Uh, Jacob and Hannah Robinson both got first class honours degrees. Can anyone make it? Well done, guys. Fantastic. And hopefully they'll be bringing money into the house soon, Glenn, okay? That's the Lord. That's the way it is. Uh, Josh gets married in a couple of weeks' time on a Friday, and uh, you're all invited. We're down at uh, Arise Church at one o'clock on the 5th of August. And uh, we're praying God's blessing on that marriage, aren't we? And. Uh, Good stuff. We did, a, we did an escape room yesterday, and I got out, praise the Lord. So that's why I'm here this morning. So it's all, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Bless the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, would you open your word? Would you make it clear and plain to us, Lord? We thank you that you're never ambiguous when you speak. Lord, it's us that confuses your voice sometimes. But I pray this morning that the clarity of what you have to say to us will just change us forever, Lord. We long to serve you more and to give you the best that we can give you. So open your word to us right now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians and chapter 2 and verse 12. Now, I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found the Lord had opened a door for me. I still had no peace of mind because I didn't find my brother Titus there, so I said goodbye to them and went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. We, we, for we are of God's pleasing aroma of Christ among those who have been saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma that brings death and to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from the Lord. Bless the Lord. Do you remember the last time, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at um, just dealing with people with grace and that discipline was not a process to destroy people, it was a process to restore people. And then Paul goes on to tell them something that he wants them to know about his own personal walk. Aren't you glad that God didn't write some of your mistakes and stuff in the Bible? Uh, and, and Paul is sharing some of his heart here. And I, I think sometimes we read this stuff like really super spiritual. You've got to understand that we're just men and women like Paul. And, and we're just like the people of the Bible. Sometimes we think they are superheroes. They were sometimes, sometimes they were super stupid, but God's grace was poured out upon them. And, and so Paul says, I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. Aren't you glad that our God is a door opener today? When, when things feel shut up, when things feel like, that you can't get anywhere, it's the God who opens the doors. The Bible says he opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. And if you ever experience God opening a door, a supernatural door, it's mind-blowing. Um, some of you remember it a, a, a while ago. It's probably been about... 12 years ago now, I've done a few funerals around church and uh, I just thought that's what you did when you were a minister. And then I had a phone call from this uh, um, undertaker that said, could you go and do one in Wollaston? And I said yes, but my heart said no. And all the way there on this very snowy February morning, I was arguing with God. Everybody knows it's no good arguing with God. You never win anyway. But I was, I was arguing. I was telling him all sorts. I told him that it was stupid that I didn't want to go to Wollaston. What would I have got to do in Wollaston? Because I, I, I was, I'm a Sedgley boy. That I didn't want to do funerals anyway. I certainly didn't want to do them for money. And all this stuff was going around in my head. And I went in to see this lady and a friend was there on the settee. And uh, I, I began to just, she, she began to share about her husband. I began to share the love of Jesus. And about 15 minutes into this conversation, she said, I think God's brought you here today. I'd like to ask Jesus into my life. 
I thought, I thought it was candid camera. I thought there was somebody hiding behind the settee. And her friend jumped up off the settee and she said, I've been praying for five years for my friend. God has certainly brought you here today. And, and you know, very well in my own life and ministry, over that, that next 10-year period, God opened so many funerals for me. And do you remember, some of us will remember the Mill Theatre. We used to pack it out, didn't we, Remembrance Sunday, with all these people that God was bringing. But God opened that door. And right now, he's closed that door. But aren't you glad when God opens a door of opportunity? Um, you know, what the best thing you can do when God opens a door is get through it. And for some of you, God is going to open some doors of opportunity. Don't just sit there looking at the door thinking, I wonder what's the other side. Get through the door and find what's the other side. Because on the other side of our obedience, God begins to work and do very, very powerful things. And God opens doors and then he holds us responsible for the opportunity that is behind them. But there's a strange verse now, verse 13. But I still had no peace of mind because I didn't find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them. I went to Macedonia. In all of this, this great opportunity that God has presented to him, this open door, he said, I, don't, I don't actually don't feel good about it. In fact, I feel a bit restless. I feel a little bit like this is not for me. And this is really, really challenging on several points. Because God has placed Paul in this place of effectiveness. The trouble is, you know, when we are in a place of effectiveness for God, sometimes it don't feel good. Because what we like to do is base everything that we do in our spiritual walk on emotion. And a lot of it's nothing to do with our emotions whatsoever. God has opened this great door of opportunity. And he said, but I didn't feel at peace about it. The Lord did not tell us to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And it will make us really happy. You look at church history. The command of Jesus is to go. For some people that going has meant persecution. It's meant imprisonment. It's meant martyrdom for some people. The trouble is with Christians, we are too livy livered and we're all wishy-washy about our faith. Do you just obey the Lord and take the open door? Sometimes it doesn't feel good, but it is good because it's the will of the Lord for us. Amen? No, it's gone really quiet. Because you all wanted to be happy, didn't you? Our faith has got nothing to do with our happiness. As we are obedient, God will bless us. And blessing is far better than happiness. Because happiness is transient. But when God brings his joy and his peace and the supernatural fruit of the Spirit into our lives, then we're so much better and stronger for it. Don't, don't, let's not be pursuing happiness. Let's be being obedient. And in our obedience, we'll find God's blessing. But he didn't feel like it was the right thing to do. What in the world do I want to do this for? I can't find my friend Titus. So it, it does beg the question, was Paul out of God's will by saying, well, I moved on? You know what, I, I want to say to you this morning, I want to say it really, really clearly. Some of us have made God's will like a tight jacket, like a straight jacket. Almost like, you know, if I dye my hair blonde and it's not God's will, he's going to cut me off forever. We've been as stupid as that. I wonder if the Lord wants me to have a blue car or a red car. I actually don't think God cares. He wants us to obey his word and his will. But I bought a house in Cosley, Pastor, and it should have been sedgely. Do you think God's bothered if you've got a car and get up the hill? I, I've had so many people since I've been in the ministry come up to me and say, I think about God's will because and it's been the most minor, insignificant thing. You know what? God's got purpose for us. And it's far bigger than whether you get your, your hair's pink or you're driving a blue car or whatever else it might be. And we just try it all down like as if, you know what? Well, shall I get married, Pastor, or shall I stop single? I don't care. Just preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick. That's what the Bible says. So often we are just almost, we create this whole thing and it's all about us. If, if I do that, they'll make the will of God. God's will is far bigger than that. He's not sitting on the throne worrying about whether you driving a blue car or a purple car. He loves us this morning and his call is for us to be obedient and be wise stewards of what he is doing in our lives. And you could say, well, God had opened this great big door of, of opportunity to, to the apostle. Is he walking out of God's will now? Well, actually, the apostle knew something that some of us don't. It's not about the place. It's always about his grace. And sometimes, again, we, we limit God down. We limit God down as if like somehow that if we don't do just this little thing, then the whole of this big plan falls. I've come to, to know one thing. God is bigger than me. He's bigger than you. He's bigger than this church. And if God wants a job done, it will get done one way or the other. 
And if it's not you, it'll be somebody else. Don't you ever think that God's plans will be ruined just because we're hard of hearing or that we take a sideward step. I want to tell you this morning, our God has got an incredible plan and it finishes in glory. It finishes in this church being raptured and us going to be with the Lord forever. But somehow we make it about us as if like, whoa, we made such a big mess of it here because we dyed our hair pink on a Tuesday and it should have been brown. But you see, what the apostle understood was actually, it's about people. And this door might have opened for some service, but what he's saying is, actually, my heart and the call upon my life that you've given me, God, is about getting young Titus to become an apostle just like me. And you know what? We could have revival in this place right now for, for many, many months and the power of God falling. But if we don't prepare for the future and look for new leaders and invest in them, then the longevity of what God is doing will decline and fade. It always has. Don't ever tell me that churches last forever. I've told you before when we looked at the churches of the book of Revelation, there's not one of them there anymore. They're just places of interest on a cruise liner. But when we invest in people, because the scripture says that the church is not built on revival, although revival we do need. It says it's built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, it is key, and the apostle understood it, it's key that you use your gift and I use my gift and we create blessing for other people to have their gifts used and that we bring people on that the church might grow and prosper. So very often we just all make it about us and about our opportunity, but God's bigger than our opportunity. He wants to put opportunity in front of everybody. And I, I, blame, I blame some of the God channels for some of this stuff because they've made it about a place. It was about Pensacola. Then, then everybody left Pensacola and they all went to Lakeland and then they went to the Bay of the Holy Spirit Revival. As I said to you earlier, it's not about the place, it's about his grace. I, I believe Sedgley's important in God's plan. But you know what? If we fail, he'll just raise up another bunch that will carry on his purposes here. So we just need to understand that God is far bigger than we are, and we just take our pay, our part. And so I don't believe that the apostle was out of God's will. I believe he had a heart to see the church grow. I believe he had a heart to see evangelism. And he knew one thing. If it wasn't going to be this door in trials that's open to him, it's going to be somewhere else. But if we will be obedient to the voice of God and allow the Holy Spirit to use us wherever we are, we'll find God moving wherever we are. And some of you God has taken from other churches and planted you here for this season. And we are so, so very grateful. And God, God used you where you were before. And now he's using you here. And if we'll stop obedient and we'll stop full of the Holy Spirit, we'll see God move, won't we? Bless his name. But thanks be to God who leads us in captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now he's referring now to an act that used to happen. What used to happen is the Romans used to take over a city or a village or something, and they, they take captive all the people. And then they would parade them through the streets, and they would show them off and say, these are our spoils of war, this is what we have won. I want to tell you this morning, before all of the world, God is prayed in his church, but he's not prayed in us as captives, because he has set us free. We're no longer captives, are we? He's parading us in front of the whole world and saying, these are my sons, these are my daughters, these are my people, these are my friends, and I love them with all of my heart. We're God's spoil this morning. Jesus won us on the cross, and he is parading us in front of the whole world and saying, this is what my grace can do. That guy who came in here this morning, he clearly needed the grace of God. I believe before very long, he'll be one of those in the procession with us. And we have to trust the Lord this morning for what he is doing. He wants them to understand that the Saviour is displaying us as his spoils of war. He's walking us around and he's declaring this total victory. As some of you walk into this building today, God is already shouting, look at, look at what I've done. Every time I see Andy Flute, it makes my heart glad because I think, look what the Lord has done. He, he's walked him in, in victory. As he walked in here this morning, he's saying to the Holy Sedgley, you know what that man was, but he's mine now. And others just like him all across this congregation and many yet to come. Spoils of God's victory. Isn't that wonderful? He says that we're a pleasing aroma for Christ among those who have been saved and those that are perishing. Have you ever been, uh, have you ever, ever walked through Beatty's? Do you remember Beatty's, everybody? That's an old, the, per, the perfume counter. What a pleasing aroma. 
it, it smells, there's nothing like it on God's earth or you go, go to Harrods in London and, and you go through the perfume department and th- there's this smell and this aroma or if ever, ever driven past a bacon and egg sandwich shop what a pleasing aroma that is and what he's saying is that what used to happen as they led these people in triumphal procession, they used to light all of this incense and it used to be making this smell. Now, spells provoke a lot of memories, don't they? Sometimes you'll smell something, it'll take you back to when you were three or four. You know, if I was to smell that uh, bubble gum that I used to chew at school and make all my teeth rotten, then, uh, you know, it would take me right back to my classroom in, with Miss Vickers in Queen Vic. I know it would. But you know what? Smells always provoke response. You know, we went for a curry yesterday and the smell was amazing. But for some people who don't like curry, they were doing, oh, that stinks. I was going, I could smell it before we got there. This is really good. But the smell needs to provoke a response. And what the, what the apostle is saying here is, your salvation, who you are bought of Christ, should be provoking a response. And there's two responses that he provokes. The aroma either brings death to people or life to people. And I want to say to you this morning, a watered-down gospel is not good enough because it should always bring a response, either a response of death or of life. Now, there's, there's no greater reality than death and life. If you've ever sat at a bedside with somebody that is there and then gone, you'll realise, wow, this... This life is like transient. It's like it's gone in a heartbeat. Or in a breath, it, it, it's gone. And then when, you, when, you're, when you're there and, guys, if you ever have to go to a birth, take plenty of sandwiches. Because they, they tell you it's going to be a couple of hours. You'll be there two days. <laughs> and, um, but, but when the baby pops out, it wasn't there. They don't, they don't pop out now. When it, it, when it, when it, was, it wasn't there. And then it's there. I thought I'd sussed it out. When Josh came out, Claire gave him to me and I, I jiggled him and he went really quiet. I thought, this is easy. <laughs> 24 years on, forget that idea. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's, but, it? But he's saying what should happen here is that who we are in God, because of the smell, the good smell of victory that Jesus has brought in our lives, should create two responses. You see, they create the world to say, I don't want to be anything to do with them. I hate them. It brings death or it brings joy in life. It shouldn't bring something in the middle. If it brings something in the middle, we're, we're not being the aroma that God wants us to be. You know, one brings ultimate optimism, doesn't it, birth, and the other brings ultimate despair. I'd much rather people just despair of us in this town and say, they're just a bunch of loonies in that church. At least there'll be a response. For them not even to know that we're here, or even if they know that here we go, oh, them, them Christians, I could take them or leave them. I don't want them to take me or leave me. They either want me to hate me or join me. Because we have to be either one thing or another. Because this aroma should provoke a response. And the last thing we want it to do is provoke apathy. We do not. Verse 17, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. See, the church, although we grumble about the church today, the church across the generations has really not changed. There were still people in that first early church trying to peddle the word of God for profit and jump on the bandwagon and merchandise the word of God for self-profit. But you know what? The gospel is about saving souls. It's not about making money. And we have to be really clear about that because we live in a culture and a day and a generation, especially that which is... Uh, coming over the Atlantic from America where it's all about the prosperity, it's all about the money, it's all about the giving, it's all about the tithing. Those things are important, but they're the the most important thing. You know what? You could take the word of God and not have a penny in your back pocket and see lives transformed. I'm not saying we don't need money, but our priority is not the focus on the money. Our priority is the focus upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, There are legitimate expenses when we have to preach the gospel. And the scripture says those that preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But unfortunately, in our generation, the church has gone into two extremes. One in England and one in America. In England, basically, the deacons have been so mean that the pastor's been paid nothing. That is a disgrace. And one day they will answer before the judgment seat of Christ for how they've treated his servants. On the other hand... We don't want to be flying our pastors around like celebrities in jets. That's also a disgrace. And don't you dare ever send anybody from the God Channel 30 quid for a prayer cloth or anything else. 
Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't need this big hand on the towel. You need the touch of the Holy Spirit on your life. Amen. But we have to get these things into our heart. It's incredibly important that we understand that the, the gospel is not here to make money. It's here to change lives. And so that's why we don't do a lot of preaching and teaching on money in this church. I believe that as, as God blesses you, you should give. And, and we do give and thank God for your giving. But the most important thing is that we preach the gospel. And th there should be no cost to those that are listening to the gospel. We're not here to keep pushing the plate around, filling the church with people, so we can solicit money from them. As we did this morning with that man who came through the door, it was just a wonderful privilege and opportunity because of what God has done in our lives to be able to pray for him and tell him about the love of Christ and give him a Bible. And this is what we are here for, isn't it? Amen. Bless the Lord. So when you watch some of that tripe from America, just remember what the pastor says, okay? Please don't send your money to places where the man has already got a, a Learjet and uh, 15 cars in the garage. That is not the heart of God, I believe, with all of my heart. He says, on the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, as those sent from God. To handle God's word is the most precious thing in all the world. I deem it as an absolute privilege to stand here this morning and open the Bible with you. Because we teach and preach the Bible, not so we can exploit people, but so we can expound truth. And it's the truth that sets people free, isn't it? I want some of you to understand this morning what the whole sort of ethos of what I've been trying to say is that the, the apostle gets to this great door of opportunity but there's something greater than this just one single door of opportunity he, he knows there is a life to be lived and there are people to be discipled I think the key thing that we need to grasp in this church is that we need to love God with all of our hearts take the opportunities that are given to us but more than that invest in people invest in people do what we need to do and understand who we are in Christ. And that investment should be an aroma. The people in this world should look at the church and go, look how they love each other. Look how they look after each other. Look how they care for each other. And then just allow God to move and, and use us in the way that he wants to use us. Not because there's money in it. Listen, you're never going to make money as a pastor, not in this country anyway. You're never going to make money coming to church. All of us in the main are volunteers in this place. And I thank God for your volunteering. But let's do it with a passion. Let's do it so this world either wants to join us or really not join us. But there should be no in-between. When those doors are open, people should fall through and say, what should I do to be saved? Otherwise, they should be writing placards and slogans and telling us to clear off. If we're not causing a reaction and response... We're not, we're, not, we're not in the right place. You know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about being the moral majority, because a lot of that is just a whole a lot of huff and puff. And again, I'm, I, I, it sounds like I'm anti-American this morning. I'm not anti-American. I'm going to America soon. But the, the truth of it is, let's not call ourselves pro-life and then and dismiss all the abortion stuff and then go around carrying guns and say, it's all right to shoot people. Because it's hypocrisy. Let's be Christians. We're not conservatives or Labour. We're not Democrats or Republicans. We're sons and daughters of the living God. And we choose to be the aroma of Christ. We choose to be paraded by Jesus and let people say, look what the Lord has done. Look at those people. Look what God has done in their hearts and in their lives. What an amazing God we serve this morning. Amen. And, I, I, and some of you, if you're struggling with the will of God, please, please, please don't think it's down to us. I know I use some strange examples about cars and hair, hair colour. But there, there are people who have written their whole Christian life off because so, they think they've missed God's will. Listen, God is for you. He will open doors. And after, if you're stupid enough and not even to go through a door, he's opened. You know what? He's gracious enough to open another one. You live long enough, you'll understand that if you, if you take a wrong turning, the Lord will bring you back. Have you ever argued with your sat-nav? Don't do that either. That's just futile as well. That's not arguing with God. But I, I always seem to know better than the sat-nav. And you know what? He always brings me around in a circle. And I just think sometimes that how God is with us. That sometimes we take a step in the wrong direction. But be assured of this. If we love him and our hearts are engaged with him, even if we make the minor discretion or mistake, he's still for us. There's so many people that have left church going, well, I'm not in the will of God, or I thought I'd be here by now. Listen, it's not the end of the day yet, is it? God's not finished his plans for us yet, has he? 
I could look back now and go, well, I, I thought I'd be a lot further on than I am right now. But you know what? Even if I made some mistakes, I still believe the God who's made the promises over my life and over your life. Isn't that good? Bless his name. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your word this morning. I want to, I want to thank you that you're not finished with any of us. And Lord, in this church, we want to be an aroma in this community. Either one that provokes to death or provokes to life. But Lord, help us not be mediocrity, have mediocrity in our hearts or be a, a, apathetic about what we do. But Lord, help us to be that sweet smelling aroma of Christ into this community and beyond. Help us to serve you. Help us to develop others. And help us, Lord Jesus, to see you opening and closing doors and be obedient in all that you've got for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We can bless the Lord in all things, can't we? We know that he's got his hand fixed upon us and will never let us go. Amen. Bless the Lord. Let's stand together if we're able. Let's sing our first, uh, our first song. Our last song. Amen. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to your grave. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, blessed be shining down. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. 
next six weeks we don't have to stack any chairs at all so that's good isn't it praise the lord summer holidays so don't forget tuesday prayer meeting father in the name of jesus we thank you for this morning we thank you for your presence we thank you for your clear direction from your word help us to be all that you want us to be lord we're a hungry people lord we desire to see this community changed and transformed and we desire to be part of that lord so use us how you would Open doors of opportunity to us this week in a special way. Lord, as we pray together, Lord, I pray that we'll see incredible things happen, Lord, just because you're among us, Lord. And, and so I commit our families and our friends to you today. For all those we mentioned at the beginning, for Chris Pitt, for Angela, for Sarah's dad, would you just bless him right now in the name of Jesus. Benita, Lord, raise her up. Matt Badley, right now, we call out a healing over his life in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would strengthen him in his bones in the name of Jesus. And Lord, would you just be with Pastor John there in the QE? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning and God bless you.